So this lab is on uh, probability, uh, probability distributions, and some basic uh, concepts of frequent statistics. Uh, first start off with uh, the notion of, uh, of probability. Uh, for something that's that kind of important to all our subjects, it's actually rather poorly defined. And people usually talk about probability as a set of axioms. In fact, you can straight off the bat think of three different ways in which you can think of probability. If I gave you a dice, for example, or a coin, you can toss a coin in two ways. And if you have a belief that that coin is fair, it's going to come up heads and tails. And you have this kind of notion that these are equally likely options, so that the probability of each one is half. So this is a kind of notion of probability by symmetry. Another example is a six-sided dice. You intuitively think that the probability of throwing a, throwing a five or a four or a three or any number there is going to be one sixth because there are six possibilities. You think it's a fair dice. And so that since there are six ways to do it, the probability of any one of them is one sixth. So this is a notion of probability by, by symmetry. You can also sort of like ask the question as to what's the probability of uh, Donald Trump winning the elections uh, come the next election cycle. And that's an event that happens just once. And so the question then arises, what do you mean by a probability associated with such an event? And there are many answers that you can give to this question. It could be, for example, your belief in Donald Trump winning. Uh, it could also be your belief in a Republican winning the election based on a model that you've created. It's, that's another way of thinking about it. But is this kind of more, um, if you like, fuzzy kind of notion of what this probability is. Another example is rain. You'll see uh, simulations which will tell you the probability of rain tomorrow in Boston is 10%. And What's being done out there is some big weather model is running, and in 10 out of the in 10, 10 out of 100 cases in which the simulation is run, it rains in Boston, and so that's where they come up with the probability of 10 out of 100. Uh, again, it's a one-off event, and so uh, you're making a statement about a one-off event. But the one that the the sort of definition of probability that you are probably most familiar with is the frequentist notion of probability, where you actually repeat a thing many, 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 many times and see what the long-run behavior is. So if you didn't know, for example, that a coin was fair, what you would do is you would toss it, and you would toss it, and you would toss it, and you would toss, toss it ad nauseum, uh, and you would see how many times you got heads out of the total number of times you tossed the coin. And uh, if it was a fair coin, you would believe, and you would see that you would probably get like roughly 50%. But this is an important point, that if you toss a coin four times, you're not all the time, in every set of like four coin tosses you do, you're not going to get two, two of them come up heads. Sometimes you'll get none, sometimes you'll get one, sometimes you'll get two, sometimes you'll get three, and sometimes you'll get all four. And these sort of uh, divergences from the long run behavior of what you would expect, that is two out of four, are what I call fluctuations. And it's fluctuations that give rise to probability distributions. Uh, for a set of coins, for example, if you're, if you're tossing a coin uh, four times or eight times or n times, the probability of getting k coin tosses coming off as heads in n is given by a distribution called the binomial distribution, for example. So to recap over here, basically, uh, this is this notion of probability as frequency. But the long run behavior is not what you're going to necessarily get uh, when you do a finite number of coin tosses. You're going to get fluctuations. And these fluctuations give rise to probability distributions. So over here in this code, which you see in this, uh, in this particular notebook, I have uh, a function defined here, which is called throw a coin. And throw a coin uses uh, np, to, np is numpy, numpy.random.choice. And that basically chooses stuff between things in an array. And it does it n times. So it'll throw it n times. So if I put like 50 out here, it'll give me 50 coin tosses. And for the 50 coin tosses, it's going to give me a strings of, a, of, of h or t. Uh, these are the two possible things inside the set. Oh, this needs to be bigger? Sure. OK. So you can then ask the question, what is the number of heads you get? And you can just do a sum off the, throw, off, off the cases in which the throws are h. And you can see that the syntax, which now is sort of a numerical Python syntax, is very similar to the panda syntax, where you might say pd df.throws is equal to h or something of that sort. Uh, the syntax, that's not an accident. Uh, Pandas was created to sort of mirror the NumPy syntax. And so this is asking for a sum of the times that the throws are equal to h. So basically, you're going to get a 1 or a true for each time the throw is equal to h and false otherwise. And it's going to sum the trues. And you're going to get the number of uh, heads. And if you do this over here, you get heads 16 times. Uh, 
and I've thrown this coin 40 times, so I've only in 16 out of 40 in this particular scenario gotten heads when I do this. Uh, just a quick uh, point pointer on how to get random numbers in NumPy. They're all defined inside the np.random module. Choice is one of those, which allows you to, pu to pull stuff from an array with or without replacement. In this particular scenario, we're doing it with replacement. And by with replacement, it means that if I pull an H the first time, I'm allowed to put an H the second time, which is exactly what I want to do if I have a coin, basically. Uh, you can set a flag to say uh, pull it without replacement, and there are uses for that as well. But we can come to that later. OK, so here I'm throwing a coin 40 times, and I get 16 heads. So say I run this whole process again, which is, uh, which is another replication of this, uh, of this 40 coin toss. And I do it again, and this time I get 24 heads. And so you see, it's not going to be the 20 heads you, you might think it would be all the time. You're going to get these fluctuations around there. And let me do it many, many more times. So this time, let me do it 10,000 times. And I'm just printing out the first 1,000, because otherwise, all the space here will get taken, taken up. And you see that we get about 5054. And what you'll notice is that as you get to a larger and larger and larger number, the sort of percentage of fractional difference from half, which is like 5,000 over here, becomes smaller and smaller. In fact, we can actually see this very systematically, where we uh, make trials of size 10, 10 coin tosses, 20, 50, 70, all the way up to 10,000. And we repeat the entire process uh, for each one of these trials and plot it, and this is what we get. So you see what happens is that when you actually start out with very, uh, by the way, this is a log kind of uh, axis on the x-axis, which is why it kind of looks equidistant, but really that whole thing is squeezed into the corner if it was a linear uh, plot. And so you see that the probability of getting uh, of heads from the simulation is kind of high at the beginning, and it can be quite different from 0.50, but as you go closer and closer and make more and more trials, it actually keeps being quite close to 50. And you can run this uh, many times, uh, and you'll see that the actual plot looks a little bit different each time, but the general feature of the plot is the same, that basically you have this kind of white thing at the beginning which narrows down as time goes on. So what's happening is that the true odds are fluctuating, as I said, about the long run value of 0.5, um, and you're getting a distribution uh, out of this. Uh, so each, so let's actually establish a bit of terminology. Each finite length run, let's say of maybe 50 or, or 100 tosses, we're going to call that a sample. And if we do that 100, uh, 100 coin toss again and again and again and again, so in fact we have an ensemble of samples, we'll call those either an ensemble of samples or replications. Um, and that's the kind of language we'll use. OK. So this is about coin tosses. Uh, let's think about a simple election model. Um, and the selection model is, comes from a table of probabilities that this company, PredictWise, made available to us on October 2nd, 2012 for the, president, for the last presidential election. And in this table, they gave us a bunch of probabilities. I'm not going to talk about how they came up with these probabilities. They probably had a complex model behind it. But these are the probabilities they kind of came up with. So for example, in Arizona, there is a 0.06% probability that Obama would win a 0.938%. Uh, uh, fraction of 93.8% uh, probability that Romney would win. Now, if you look at that, what does this mean? You have to ask the question, what does this mean? So again, let's talk about this as a long run problem. You can think of these probabilities as unfair coins. So in other words, in Arizona, Obama was dealt a coin in which he would almost never get heads and would have tails most of the time. In fact, you can see that 6% of the time you toss the coin in, you, you'd, get a, you'd get Obama, and then 90, 94, roughly 94% of the time you toss the coin in Arizona, you would get Romney. And that's how uh, biased that coin is. But again, remember that this is the long run behavior, that if you were to toss this coin again and again and again, of course, you can't do the election again and again and again, but just imagine you're living in a million parallel universes, and you can run this, uh, and you can, you, you can actually run this whole process, this election, in each one of those universes. And then you'd find that basically in about uh, you know, roughly 6% of those universes, uh, Obama would actually win in Arizona. And that's what this probability means. And so if you want to show what happens in all the simulations, uh, you can do this. And I'm going to show you how to do this here uh, in this function simulate election which takes some kind of, uh, of model over here and does a number of simulations. And what I do is I create a simulation as a two-dimensional array of uniformly uh, distributed random numbers. 
Now, a uniformly distributed random number is a number between 0 and 1, sort of the space of where probabilities lie. Um, and what I'm doing is that I'm doing a simulation in which each time I'm throwing a coin and I'm trying to get a number between 0 and 1. And I get this number between 0 and 1, and I'm doing it in an array of size 51 because there are 50 states and DC, basically, times the number of simulations, the number of times I do it. And then I check that if that number is less than the value, that then the, uh, the probability of Obama winning in that particular state. And if it's so, I, I, I pick it. Otherwise, I don't. And then I sum, basically, uh, over all the states. Um, and I'll leave you to look at the details of the code later and figure out why access equal to zero sums over all the states. And this gives me the total number of Obama votes uh, because I actually add in, I think you can't see this because I've made this a bit big. I take the, uh, the, the number of times that the, number you th that the random number you get is less than the probability times the uh, model that votes, which is the number of electoral votes in the state. And so when I run this, and I run it 10,000 times over here using the probabilities that I had. And I, do, uh, I see how many times the result is, gra is, is greater than 269, which is the threshold, basically, for Obama winning the election. And you see that's 9,956 out of 10,000 simulations, Obama wins the election. Which then begs you to wonder why Romney even thought he had a chance. Uh, this is one month out. OK, so maybe it would, the gap would close out and so on and so forth. But Romney's camp probably didn't understand it, their statistics particularly well. And uh, it was kind of overwhelming even one month before. So we can sort of plot the simulation. Again, I'll leave you to figure out the details of how this, uh, how this plot are done. But basically what I'm doing is there are these 10,000 simulations. And each simulation that is now calculated out here, a certain number, basically, of, uh, uh, of, of votes that, again, I can actually look at it by opening up a cell here. And you can see that it's an array. It's a 10,000 element array. And in one of the simulations, it gets 3,000. In the other simulation, it gets 319. And why is this? Why do these numbers differ? Again, remember, for each state, I am tossing a coin. And sometimes you're going to get heads, and sometimes you're going to get tails. If you're in Arizona, you're going to get heads only 6 uh, You know, um, If you're Obama, you're going to only get heads like 6% of the time. If you're Romney, you're getting heads 94% of the time. But in some of these simulations, Obama's actually going to win Arizona. And so these totals are going to differ. And the ones in which he wins Arizona are probably the ones in which this number is kind of high. Uh, so that's what's happening over here. And so you get a distribution of his total electoral votes uh, from here, which you can then plot using this plot simulation function here. And you can see that the distribution looks something like this. That, and this distribution looks hairy. Uh, because there's only, it's, it's votes, so there's only, it's not a continuous variable. It's a, there are gaps, you can't get all the possible numbers. And, uh, but there are different kinds of results. And again, you can see what you saw when I said only 5%. There are very few cases, and this is what, this is the threshold needed to win the election. There are very few cases in which there's any mass of this probability over here, and almost all of the bulk of, this, of the things happening are out here. And the red line over here is the actual, is the actual result that Obama won by. So this model is not quite entirely great because you know, the bulk of the mass seems to be over here. But it doesn't do a bad job. Predict tries not do a bad job of capturing what happens. Uh, as you might have expected, as, you know, as elections become sort of later in the cycle, the gap tends to close. That's, thing, that's something that people have found. And so uh, uh, you get this kind of movement uh, in the graph. So, uh, so well, the, thing, the thing to take, to take home, though, from this graph uh, is that basically it's the, uh, the results of your analysis are never going to be a point necessarily. It's going to be a distribution. And this kind of distribution is called an uh, empirical probability distribution, basically, uh, as opposed to some of the distributions you might know, like you know, the Gaussian distribution or the Poisson distribution or the binomial distribution. This is what, and this is the specific distribution for his electoral college votes, and it's what we found by actually running the simulation. OK, so now that you know that uh, this is the case, you understand why you know, when Nate Silver made his predictions, he would say something like Obama has a 99.2% chance of winning, so on and so forth. He never said Obama's going to win the election, because he was doing a process in which he came up with these probabilities, then he would throw these, these coins, and he would come up with this, uh, this, kind of a, this kind of a plot and see 
how much of the mass of this plot was on that side of the threshold line. So I'm at this moment being admittedly a somewhat kind of vague about uh, these kind of concepts. Let's formalize these a little bit. So in probability theory, uh, you always talk about the sample space of an experiment, which is a set of all possible outcomes. For example, if I have one coin, the set of possible outcomes is heads or tails. If I have two coins, it's heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails. But I could also talk about that in, an, in another way. I can say, what's the, 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 the possible set of outcomes are? The possibility of two heads, the possibility of one head, and the possibility of zero heads. And if I do that, for example, for the, for the one coin uh, case, if I have the random variable as a number of heads, then the probability of zero heads is half, and probability of one head is also half. Because when you get zero heads, you get one tail. But you, then you could ask about, as I said, the number of heads in two coin tosses, and then the probability of zero heads is one fourth. The probability of one head is half, because you can get it in two ways, heads, tails, or tails, heads. And the probability of getting uh, two of them as heads is also one fourth, because then you get heads, heads over there. So I think I said probably, probably if zero was heads, heads. I actually meant tails, tails in that one. OK. So the random variables, uh, they, the other thing that links basically uh, the, uh, the events in the sample spaces um, to, to data, essentially. And so what we're typically doing, the process we're always doing, is we're looking at some data and asking what kind of probability distribution could this data have been generated from. Uh, and it is this kind of probability distribution that we are typically interested in. So um, I'm going to very, very quickly go over this notion of Bernoulli random variables. A Bernoulli random variable is just basically a coin flip. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of random variable x, where x equal to 1 is heads and x equal to 0 is tails. And uh, let us further say that the probability of heads is p, where p equal to 0.5 is a fair coin. So you know, p equal to 0 0.06 is what you would find for Obama in Arizona, for example. So the notation we'll use again and again, and you'll see this in multiple places in this course and elsewhere, is we'll say that x tilde Bernoulli p, which is to be read as basically x has distribution Bernoulli given the parameter p. And that's called a parameter. That's the distribution. That's the random variable. And you'll get different values of it, basically based on the probability distribution function or the probability mass function. So the probability distribution function here is the probability that a random variable x may have the particular value x small x. So in this case, the va x can take the values 1 and 0. So you can ask the question, what's the probability that x equal to 1? And then you put p to the 1 over here and 1 minus p to the 0. Uh, 1 minus p to the 0. So the 1 minus p goes away. So small p is the probability that x equals 1, i.e. the probability of heads. And when you take x equal to 0, then that thing becomes 1, and that thing becomes 1 minus p, which is kind of obvious. This is 1 minus p is going to be the probability of tails over there. So that's how you'd write it. And then you can calculate, for example, things like the average of this, uh, where you have, uh, if you had n trials, uh, then the probability of getting, uh, getting heads in n trials is p, and the probability of getting tails in n trials is 1 minus p. So it's, n, it's p times n plus 1 minus p times n, which should give you p. I think I may have actually messed up that. Uh, no, at times 0. And that's the value of the variable itself. So that's x is equal to 1, and then x is equal to 0. And then that basically gives you p times n divided by n, and that gives you p. So the uh, average value of the Bernoulli distribution is just p. We can see how this works uh, when we do uh, when we actually uh, do the numerical Python stuff. So all, numerical Python has this particular particular module called SciPy, and inside SciPy there is a submodule called Stats. And in stats, all the distributions are kind of defined. Well, not all of them, but most of the distributions are defined. One of which is Bernoulli over here. And I can get a Bernoulli random variable by just calling Bernoulli with p equal to 0.3. That actually sets up a, uh, a, a Bernoulli quote unquote class instance, if you like. And then you can pick random variables from it. And here I'm picking 20 random variables. So RVS stands for random variables here. So this is the way I generate 20 random variables from this distribution. So if I wanted to generate 1,000 coin tosses or 10,000 coin tosses, I could just put size equal to 10,000 in here. And I would get 10,000 of these variables, which are either ones or zeros. So that entire code where I did np.random.choice in terms of the t's and the h's, I can now do in terms of these ones and these zeros, basically. And you can look at the, you can visually look at what this looks like for different values of p. And it's not quite surprising. <coughs> 
um, if you have uh, point 0.1, then basically the probability of 1 is like point 0.1, and that's point 0.9. So this is kind of a, a superfluous, uh, obvious kind of plot. But the reason I have it on here is so that you can actually see how to call the various, uh, the, the various things uh, about the, the distribution. So the things you need to know over here are that there's a mass function. The mass function or distribution function, uh, mass function is the word used when a probability distribution is actually on discrete variables like 1 and 0. And so here, basically, you're saying that if p is equal to 0 0.1, most of the mass is at 0 because you have a 90% chance of, of, uh, of, of throwing a 0 rather than throwing a 1. And then only 10% of the mass is over here. This little line over here shows the, the cumulative distribution function of this distribution. And the cumulative distribution function is just the idea of you go from the left of the distribution to the right of the distribution, and you see what is the probability that the random variable is less than a certain value. So the probability that a random variable is kind of less than, uh, less, uh, is, is kind of less than 0, starts off at 0, and then by the time you get to 1, it becomes 1. It's a little bit hard to see in a Bernoulli, but we'll see it a little bit more clearly a little later. So we talked a little bit about the uniform distribution. Uniform distribution is basically something that gives, that chooses numbers uniformly between 0 and 1. It's probably easiest to think about this in terms of, dis, uh, terms of discrete things. So if I give you 10 things and I said the probability of choosing each one of them was equal to the other, that's a uniform distribution and that's a uniform discrete distribution. Uniform distribution is just a generalization of that to any, to, to any interval. And usually it's done on the unit interval between 0 and 1. And you say, if you try and get num uh, random variables uh, thrown according to a uniform distribution, then you're basically p uh, picking up any number in between that. So you know, getting a point, the, the probability of getting a 0.4 is equal to the probability of getting a 0.5 is equal to the probability of getting a 0.6. It's one of the most useful distributions by far because it's the distribution for it's the distribution to which you can look at for the cumulative distribution function and then invert to actually get probability distribution functions. Okay. And then the empirical distribution, as I, as, as, I, as, as I referred to a little while earlier, is uh, kind of the, uh, the probability mass function or the probability density function, which comes from actually looking at the data you get. So you're looking at. Could you clarify probability mass function versus probability density? Yeah, I can. So, so mass function is used when you have uh, a, a discrete set of uh, outcomes. So in the, in the case like in, in the Obama elections, it's really a mass function because there's only a discrete set of values that you can get for the number of votes because of the way the various electoral votes in every state adds up. If you're looking at something which is, which is continuous, like a Gaussian distribution, then you have a probability for every possible value in between, uh, in between you know, minus infinity and plus infinity. And so um, that's when you use a probability density function. Uh, sometimes people just use density function for everything because it's simpler to, to talk about it in that particular fashion. So as I said, there's a second very useful question that we can ask of a, of a probability density. What is the probability that a random variable is less than some value? So in other words, you're asking for p of capital X less than some x. And this, as I said, is called the cumulative distribution function. Or sometimes this is just called the distribution. Uh, in statistics books, you might actually find that this is called the distribution, whereas the probability density function or the probability mass function is what's called the density. I have to admit that this terminology confused me a little bit at the beginning. Uh, but it's what's used. Uh, and it's basically is, uh, by, uh, obtained by summing the probability to density for all x less than x. So you, uh, I'm doing this here for, uh, for, the, for the case of, Ob of the Obama election. But I define a function CDF, which is the sum of everything in the result that is less than x divided by the shape of that. So what's going on over there? The shape is telling you what's the size of, that, of the result array. We did 10,000 simulations, remember? So that's, uh, that's 10,000, basically. And this is to asking how many of the results are less than x. So if x was, let's say, let's pick a number, 280 votes, this is asking how many of those things in those 10,000, the, the numbers in those 10,000 uh, element array result are less, than, uh, are less than 270, I said, right? And then I'm adding all of those up. So I'm getting the number of them. And divide by the total number, so that's giving, going to give me the probability that it's that in all of these 10,000 simulations, I have values less than 270. And we can see this. So I printed out a different values out here. The CDF at 200 votes is zero, so no way was Obama getting less than less than 200 votes. Uh, if you remember, 269 was the cutoff, but even going all the way to, six, to, to 300, it's only 
So it's telling you that the probability of Obama getting less than or equal to 300 is 0.145. It's actually making a fair, again, another way to make that fairly strong statement that he had a very, very good chance of winning the election. OK, and you can plot this. And it has this tell-type shape that CDF functions tend to, tend to have because they have to go up to 1 by the time you get to the right side because you, you know, that's taken over all your probability uh, sample space. And on the left side, it starts off at some, some 0. I mean, it, may, it, it can go from 0 to 1 in different ways. It doesn't have to have necessarily this S-shaped curve. Uh, but this is one way in which it might happen. Typically, it's kind of like this, because at the beginning, not much is happening on the left side of the tail. And then it starts picking up. And then by the time you've gotten to the right side of the tail, most of it is done. So it just, again, asymptotes in this particular fashion. Again, if you had a Gaussian distribution, you'd look at the, uh, which I haven't defined a Gaussian distribution, but you're probably familiar with it or seen it in the, uh, you know, in newspapers and so on and so forth. And so forth. It's a distribution that kind of looks like a bell curve, like that. Basically, so at the beginning, there's not much. And then as you go towards the end, all the mass is already done. OK. So that's uh, the, uh, the notion of a CDF. I'm going to leave the binomial distribution out. But as I said, but you're kind of familiar with it. It's a notion of uh, in n coin tosses, what is the probability of getting k heads? And here's actually a, uh, a little diagram of it, which is taken from the of all places of Feynman lectures on physics. And it's an, an excellent actual introduction to probability and statistics in, uh, in I think, chapter 6 of the Feynman Lectures. Uh, and I stole this diagram from there. And it basically shows all the possible ways in which you can get like heads and tails in uh, three coin tosses. And uh, the distribution associated with this is called the binomial distribution. And I have some of the properties written out here. And this is what it kind of looks like uh, for different values of p. Again, remember, what you're doing in a binomial distribution is you're talking about k heads in n coin tosses. So it's basically an amalgamation, if you like, of doing n Bernoulli trials. So remember, the Bernoulli distribution talked about what happened for one coin toss. The binomial distribution talks about what happens for n of these. And it shows you what these curves look like. Uh, for diff uh, this diagram shows you what these curves look like for different values of, uh, the, um, of the, the p variable. Obviously, when p is equal to 0 0.1, you have most of the mass with very, very few tosses string up heads. And when you go at 0.9, most of it's on the other side. So that's the look of it. OK. Finally, uh, various ways uh, on this notebook, the various ways to get random numbers is something is just a little thing to look up for you. Uh, random.choice lets you get stuff randomly from a list. Random.random .random gives you uniform randoms on 0, uh, on zero and 1. Uh, randint gives you random integers in an array. Uh, randn gives you random normal uh, numbers from a normal distribution. And then scipy.stats.distrib, uh, where in, you substitute for distrib your favorite distribution, like binom for binomial, Bernoulli for Bernoulli. Um, what is it? I think Poisson for Poisson. Uh, this gives you properties of the distribution. And if you use the function RVS, it will give you random variables from the distribution, i.e., it's basically giving you throws from the distribution. Uh, if you use PDF or PMF, depending upon whether it's a continuous or discrete distribution, it's going to give you an idea of what the shape of the distribution function looks like. Uh, you can also do a CDF. It will give you an idea of what the shape of the CDF looks like. Uh, and as I said, just using distrib as a function with its params creates this kind of instance variable, which is a random variable generating object. And from that, you just call RVS in kind of this form. Remember, it was Bernoulli of p, p might have been 0.1 or something, dot RVS of like size equal to 100, and you got 100 Bernoulli variables. So that's something to remember. In, uh, this is one of the nice things about scipy.stats, all of the distributions. Uh, have exactly this form. So once you know any one of them, you know how to call any of, any other, uh, any, any of the other ones of them, except for you need to know how to parameterize those distributions. OK. So, so this is your little introduction, if you like, to uh, probability and distributions. And I'm going to switch a little bit to uh, talking about uh, frequentist, uh, st uh, frequentist statistics over here. And which should follow. I should also point out that there's a third lab, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is going to be in, in, the, in, in the repo, which is talking about sampling and distributions. And that talks a lot about the law of large numbers, uh, the central limit theorem, uh, the, the sampling distribution of the mean, and the sampling distribution of the variance, and probably answers some questions that you might have had as to why, for example, in a sample, when you get the standard deviation, you divide by n minus 1 and not by n. Uh, in questions of that ilk. I won't go with this app. It's just there for you to peruse. Uh, it's got a lot of interesting stuff in it. 
So if you have the time, it's not, it's not especially needed for this course, but if you have the time and the inclination, it's, uh, it'll be fun. Okay, so moving on to frequentist statistics. Okay, so you've been living under a rock if you haven't heard about this whole uh, frequentist Bayesian sort of like division that's there in, in statistics. But let's actually not go there right now and let's kind of uh, talk about uh, how we might want to deal with data. And we'll sort of like build up to uh, what frequentist statistics does for us and where it may be a little bit hard to understand what's going on over there. So. What I'm going to do here is talk about uh, some data and uh, some models we might have for the data. So the data I have over here are actually uh, data from babies being born in one 24-hour period at the Matter Mothers Hospital in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Um, so for each, there are 44 babies, uh, and the Sunday Mail recorded the time of the birth, the sex of the child, and the birth rate in grams, basically. And they converted, they already did a nice little conversion for us, the number of minutes after midnight for each birth. So the question that comes up is that you might want to figure out uh, how to sort of like talk about this data set. So you're going to do, the first thing you're going to do as you do is you clean the data set. Let's assume it's clean for the time being. Uh, and then you're going to run different kind of statistics of the data set. For example, you might want to go in here and ask for what's the mean of the minutes. So we go df dot minutes dot mean, I think I have a comma there, and I suspect this is too small, so I need to make it bigger. Okay. And so that's telling you what's the, what's the mean number of minutes since, uh, since minute zero uh, of the baby being born, and that's basically roughly 788, which is roughly 12 hours, right? 12 times 60 is about 720. So maybe about a little bit more like that, 13 hours. So perhaps a, little bit, a few more babies were born in the latter half than were born in the, uh, in the first half uh, of the time. So you, you can calculate all these kind of statistics. You've seen how to do this with, with means and standard deviations and all of these kind of things. What you may not have seen is, is, is uh, correlations. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually show you, show you guys a little bit of pandas or, and visualization code every week as we, as we go forward. So we just keep, keep, you know, keep knowing how to do that stuff. So Pandas has a very nice feature. It actually lets you get correlations between uh, numerical columns. And so you can see the, cor the correlation here between these. Um, now, really, it's sort of like the weight of a kid is not going to correlate with the minutes since midnight that the kid was born. That would be kind of really weird. But I'd actually thought that there would be a stronger correlation between sex and weight. But it's actually not that big. It's 0.22. That is a correlation, but it's not that big. Uh, it tells you I, I know nothing about babies. Okay, so here's another little visualization that you can do. Uh, so here I'm doing a facet grid, and a facet grid basically, and this is from Seaborn, and a facet grid is basically uh, a grid of the different facets that exist in data. So for example, over here, I want to do the faceting by the column, that is the sex of the baby here, and I wanted to look at this kind of weight. So what I've done over here is I've created a facet grid where the facets that are going to be there in the different plots other sex of the baby. And then for each one of those, uh, so it's like kind of like a group by the sex of the baby, if you like. And then it's going to do a histogram based on that group by. And it's doing a histogram of the weight. And it's using DF. And so it's a very nice way to actually get a little bit more complex plots out of, uh, out of Pandas data frames. And you can see what I get over here is that I get sex equal to 1 and sex equal to 2. And I forget which one is male and which one is female. I think there are less uh, sex equal to one is, one is a girl and two is a boy. So I think there were less girls in the sample than there were boys. And uh, the weight of the, the weight of the two, as you can see, the, most of the mass is around 3,500. So it's really not that different. And so that's, you can see this very quickly in the graph. So okay, this is all very nice and fine. And now we've actually characterized our data set. But so far, you know, we've, always talked about data. So in, up, up in all of the lectures so far, and in the lab so far, and in the homework so far, we've just talked about data as if it was this God-given thing. Uh, but we've never talked about what the origins of this data are, or what kind of origin story are we going to associate with this data. 
So frequentist statistics is one answer to this kind of philosophical question of what is data. And the, uh, the question you're asking out here is that is this data set just everything in the universe? Or is this data set representative of the universe? Now here, just assume that the universe only has to do with babies. And so the question you're asking is that is this sample of babies representing the entire story of the, the, the times and hospitals at which, in, uh, at which babies are born? Or is this the entire story? That this is the data set, and this is the universe, and we're going to treat this as the universe, and we're going to learn about this. If you go with the former interpretation, you can think of there being some kind of superpopulation of babies. Maybe it's babies in all hospitals in Brisbane, or maybe it's babies in all hospitals in Queensland, or maybe it's babies in all hospitals in the world, depending upon what the superpopulation was. And that this particular population of these babies at this one hospital in Brisbane um, is basically a sample from that population. And that if you were so lucky, the Lord would come to you in your dreams and tell you how to get all the samples from this population. Then what you would do is you would calculate these statistics, like the correlation, the means, the medians, and all of these various things on each one of these uh, samples. And then you would get an idea of what the variation in this thing is by going to each one of these samples. And then you would know what the variation of the weights are in all of these samples. And you'd get some idea of what's happening in the population. That's one sort of way of thinking about this. The other way of thinking about this, and we'll come to this much later in this course, is this kind of notion that no, that one sample is actually the data, is, is the data set, it's the universe, that's all there is to it. And it's our description of that data which has uh, some statistical heft. And this is sort of like the Bayesian notion of how you describe things. But for now we're just going to stick with the first notion, that we're going to assume that any data we get is basically one sample from a population and we've not been so lucky because the Lord didn't come to us in our sleep and didn't give us access to the other samples. Okay, so this is probably clearest, the notion is probably clearest to you from elections, right? Where, uh, you know, you'll get people going out and polling 1,000 people or polling 500 people there or 2,000 people somewhere else and asking them who you're going to vote for. Are you going to vote for Trump? Are you going to vote for Carly Fiorina? Or are you going to vote for somebody else? And then they're making conclusions about the superpopulation of people in the country or people in a state or people in a city, basically, uh, uh, from based on that one sample. And so that's the general game we're kind of playing in uh, frequent statistics, that we have, this, we have this sample and we're going to make conclusions about a population. So let's uh, characterize... So let's go back. So in, this, in, this, in the first half of this uh, lab, we talked a little bit about uh, probability distributions. And when we talked about probability distributions, we didn't say what this data was. And that's perfectly fine. You can use a probability distribution to characterize a sample. You can use a probability distribution to characterize a population. And you can use a, 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 some, a probability distribution to characterize all the samples which could be drawn from this population. And we'll, we'll do all of these in a second and show you the connection between them. So let's actually, right now, uh, just uh, you know, talk about uh, this particular sample which is uh, of, of babies, which is at this particular hospital, and see what distribution we might use to fit them. So in this example, we have arrival times of the babies. We don't expect, there's no particular reason to expect any kind of clustering. Uh, well, there might be. Maybe, maybe doctors only come at a certain hour and want to deliver at that hour or something of that sort. But let's, let's assume there's none of that weird stuff happening with the doctors. So there's no particular reason to think that the babies have any particular time they want to arrive. Um, so one could think of modeling these babies basically via something called a Poisson process, uh, which as I have in included the definition from Wikipedia out here. And it's basically a process which counts the number of events and the time that these events occur in a given time interval. Uh, the time between each pair of consecutive events uh, has what's called an exponential distribution. We'll look at this particular distribution, and the form is uh, over here. Uh, notice it needs to be positive because we're talking about positive differences in time. Uh, and uh, each of these uh, inter-arrival times is kind of presumed to be independent of uh, you know, other inter-arrival inter times. By the way, there's a very interesting problem associated with how much time you need to wait for a bus. Uh, which is associated with this setup as well, and you should go look it, look it up on Google and kind of enjoy yourself. Okay, so this distribution, uh, what I'm doing out here is I'm basically plotting the distribution. As you can see, there is no mass below in this distribution below zero. And basically, it's saying that the odds of there being higher and higher times uh, in between these events is less. Uh, 
Uh, and that's the model we, we, we're going to use over here. This is the exponential distribution. And here's what it looks like for different parameters. So you can see that as the, uh, you know, as the rate parameter uh, becomes higher and higher and higher, that's just basically saying how many events happened in a given time interval. Well, as more and more events happen in a given time interval, the amount of time between events goes down. So this falls much faster. And so this is your characterization. How would you draw from this distribution? Again, remember we said that you, you actually get the distribution function. Then if you want the PDF, you do the distribution function at PDF. And then if you need to get uh, the, the random variables, you can just get the random variables in that form. That's the size. And the scale is one of the parameters that you need to put in for this, for this distribution. So what I'm doing out here is I'm just giving you an, uh, this is just sort of like an example of, um, and I think I'm doing this on minus, on minus 2 to 3, of what the samples look like. And the, and the samples are done by putting these histograms, right? So I should, I should actually spend a minute on this because I have 10 minutes. Uh, OK. So I, I, I should uh, spend a minute on this because I find that this is something that actually confuses even more advanced students. There's a difference between what I mean by samples. I, it draws from the distribution and the PDF. What samples are basically is I'm saying, OK, I'm going to throw. It's, just like, it's like tossing that coin. Did I get a 1? Did I get a 0? Did I get a 1, 0? And I got some sequence, right, a 1s and zeros. And I can make a histogram of that. I got, because I had a biased coin, I got maybe 23 ones, and I got like 45 zeros or something of that sort. And that's the histogram. Samples are always drawn as histograms. So that's what you're seeing over here. So that's what's actually, what this is telling you, that this is such a distribution that there was, um, and this is normalized. So uh, you can see the norm equal to true over there. But this, what this is telling you is that there's a huge number of samples which came between 0 and 0 0.1, I suppose, over here. And less samples as you went to 0 0.2, and less samples as you went to 0 0.3, which is in accordance with the shape of the, or the PDF of the distribution. But this histogram is of the number of samples. So if you were to actually lay all these samples out in the list, you'd see that there would be like 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0.4, 0.1, 0.2, 0.1, 0.7. I mean, not in that kind of uniform way, but you see, you, you get my picture. There's lots more 0.1s than there are 0.2s, and lots more 0.2s than there are 0.3s. Um, and that's, that's what I mean by samples. So don't confuse the PDF, which is a function, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the samples per se. The samples are just a big list of everything you get. And when you make the histogram of the samples, that follows the PDF. So you can look at this uh, actually uh, by going to scipy.stats and plotting the, PDF, the, the CDF versus, the, uh, versus the, the PDF. And you can see that the CDF actually looks like, so the PDF looks like those blue dots. That's the samples. And that's the CDF going from 0 to 1 over there. And you can see that this also has to, by the end, go to 1. And it starts off at 0. And the shape isn't that kind of S-shape thing we had earlier, but it's a kind of different with a different monotonicity, it kind of goes up in that particular way. So but again, once again, that has to start off at 0 and go to 1. Keep that in mind. OK, so let's actually play with our data. So what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, the differences in time, right? So we have the times that the babies were born. And you can see those, those times over here the in, in, the, in, in the sort of, uh, wait, that's the correlation. So I'm not showing you the right thing in the minutes. So you're just going to subtract one from the other, like 5 from 64, 64 from 78, and so on and so forth, and see the amount of times, see the difference in times that the babies were born. And pandas provides a very nice function for this. It's just a diff. And I need to go from the first one onwards because there's nothing to, to subtract for the first one. So that's basically going to give you a, not a number. And then I go from one colon and to get all the, all the differences. Uh, so, so one colon, make sure that you go from Time, time 2 minus time 1, time 3 minus time 2, time 4 minus time 3, and so on and so forth. OK, so I'll get these distributions, and uh, I'm going to plot a histogram. And sure enough, this histogram looks like there's some kind of exponential decline in it. So we think, OK, this might be a good, uh, the, a, a good kind of uh, variable to use for, um, the, sorry, the exponential distribution may be a good kind of distribution to use to describe this data. This data. So you can. I'm not going to do this here, uh, but you can look at Wikipedia or anywhere, and you can see the mean of an exponentially distributed random variable x. 
with the parameter lambda can be found to be 1 by lambda over here. This makes intuitive sense, right? If you get babies at an average of 2 per hour, basically, then you can expect, uh, you know, to wait about half an hour for every baby. So it makes sense that it's 1 over lambda, so to speak. So it makes kind of intuitive sense that if there was any number it had to be, it had to be this. Um, the variance is given by 1 over lambda square, right? So the standard deviation is equal to the mean over here as a result which is just the same as the Poisson distribution. So that's one of the features of Poisson distributions is that the mean and the standard deviation are the same value. So some, you may use it to actually describe counts, but you should always check that roughly the mean and the standard deviation are the same value because you might have under dispersion or over dispersion in your, in, in your samples. Okay, so let's play this game of actually making an estimate of this lambda. So in making an estimate of this lambda, I can just take the mean of all these time differences. That's the simplest possible thing I can do. And, when I, and that's the one that you expect to come out correctly. Um, and you get uh, this kind of, uh, you know, well, lambda for mean to be about 0 0.03 and 30, about a 33 minute kind of difference, if you like, if you do one over lambda over, here, over there between the things. So we can, look, we can actually now just superimpose this on the data. So if you look at this, uh, this histogram is actually the histogram of the time differences, and this is the exponential distribution that we got by just making this kind of, uh, by, by making this kind of assumption that we're just going to take the mean of this data and do it. Now, why does the, the mean work out in that particular fashion? We'll come to that in a second. So here I have a little bit on the, on the Poisson distribution. I'll let you look at that yourself. Uh, I won't go into it right now. But it's kind of complementary to this, basically. You're looking at the number of births per hour instead. Okay. So then going back to this kind of notion of frequent statistics, I've seen this. Now, this, uh, up to now, I've only been playing with my sample, and I've told this is the distribution on my sample. But really what you want to do in life is to make uh, conclusions about the population, not about the sample. You want to make the conclusions about the arrival times of all babies, not necessarily the arrival times of babies in one hospital. So. And in the frequentist kind of notion, you view this parameter lambda as a fixed parameter and the data as random. In other words, you're expecting this kind of notion of, this, uh, of, of, of the Lord coming to you and whispering in your ear, these are the different samples I got from this population, except that you're not so lucky. So what happens here is that, I'll, uh, so I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip a little bit ahead. What you do is you do something called the bootstrap over here to do, this, uh, to do this process. So again, remember, you don't have access to the other samples. And you've calculated this lambda, but you've calculated it from just your sample, this lambda, right? You don't have access to these other samples. You don't have access to the population. What you do is just you just pretend, basically, that this particular uh, lambda is something that you, got, that you got from the sample is something that you would get from the distribution. And so you can do bootstrap in one of two ways. So you say, OK, I've got this lambda. I've calculated it in some fashion. I showed you how to do it by just simply calculating the mean, which turns out to be the same kind of answer you would get from what's called a maximum likelihood estimation. And so I would take that, uh, that, that estimate I got from that particular sample. And what I do is I now take the exponential distribution. I use the exponential distribution's RVs over here. So here is an exponential distribution. I created that instance. Then I take that exponential distribution's random variables, and I create a whole bunch of random variables, basically. And what I'm doing over here is I'm doing it at, as n, m samples times n points. So n points is the number of points that were there in these time differences. And what I'm doing is I use this distribution to generate time differences. OK? So what I've done is I had my one sample. From one sample, I picked up a lambda. Then I use that lambda to actually generate a whole bunch of random variables and to therefore generate a whole bunch of data sets which are kind of identical to the first one, but not quite, right? Because they're just using the same lambda that you got from there, but they're now generating all these different data sets. Because it just draws from exponential distributions using these lambdas. I do that, and I'm going to get a whole bunch of data sets. From this whole bunch of data sets, I will now go and for each one of those data sets, calculate lambda. And then I'll plot a distribution of these lambdas, and that's, the, that's what you get here. And that's how you kind of do inference. And this technique is called the bootstrap. And this particular version of it is called a parametric bootstrap. There's another actually somewhat simpler way to do it, uh, which is even actually kind of nicer in my opinion. What you do is you take your data set, and now you resample from this data set with replacement. What does that mean? Basically, you'll, you take this. Remember, you had np.choice where you could pick from a, from, a, from a list. 
you, this is exactly what you're going to do. You're going to pick um, stuff from this list, okay? And you're going to pick it with replacement. And that's what's, what's going to happen when you do that is, is these samples in, the, in, this, in, in your data, which were more likely, which have much more mass, they'll, they'll occur more often. And as a result, now you'll create n different data sets, which kind of look like your original data set, but are not your original data set. From each one of these, you'll calculate a lambda. And then you'll plot those lambdas together. And I do that over here. And that's the inferred distribution of the lambdas. That's, uh, and that's the histogram for it. And this is where our sample is. And so what this does for you, what the bootstrap does for you, is it gives you some kind of notion of what this population is doing. It gives you some kind of notion of um, you know, given from just one data set and then resampling from the data set, or either both uh, non-parametrically, which is what I showed you second, or parametrically first, gives you an entire set of um, uh, data sets to work with, and therefore gives you kind of notion of the various values the parameter lambda can take. So now you can sort of get a notion that, yeah, OK, so this lambda mean that I, uh, that I figured either doing uh, the, the direct mean or doing a maximum likelihood estimate is just one of these. And these are the various values it could have taken, that the, that the actual population value could have taken. And this is the process of inference, where not only do you give a point estimate that kind of characterizes your data, but you give a different set of like, uh, value estimates which characterize this data as well. And you always want to do that because you want to give confidence intervals for anything you find out about data. You want to say that in an election, for example, you want to say that, oh, um, the, the Romney's chances of winning are like you know, 53.1 plus or minus something. So whenever you see that margin of error, that plus or minus something, it is, it is some such kind of process from which this margin of error is coming. And basically, you think that this parameter that you're talking about has, has values between uh, something and something else. And it, this is not just true of parameters. You can do this for anything. I could have done this for the mean to find a distribution of means. And I could have done this for the variance to find, a, find the distribution of variances, or any other statistic that I might actually want to calculate on this data set. And so I'll conclude uh, by um, just mentioning this little piece of the lab in between, because I'm running out of time, where I actually take many, many samples off the binomial distribution. And what I'm doing here is, say, for example, I'm doing like you know, one th a sample of 1,000. Uh, and then I do lots of samples of 1,000, right? And for each one of the samples of 1,000, I'm actually going to calculate the mean. And then I'm therefore going to have a distribution of means uh, amongst these samples. And I can find what the distributions of these means are. And this distribution of the means turns out to be a Gaussian distribution. Uh, and that leads to an entire uh, whole bunch of like fun statistical theory. Thanks. <laughs>